Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is on the book of Matthew. And we're getting very close to the end of the book of Matthew. This particular lesson is lesson number 10, entitled Jesus in Jerusalem. It's a lesson for June 4 of 2016. And you could probably guess that we're talking about those final couple of days in the, primarily, those final couple of days, actually I guess three days, the triumphal entry, the, the Monday and Tuesday in the temple complex. So you could, you know there were plenty of conflicts, a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. So let's get started. I hope you have your Bible handy. Let's begin with the word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you once again for the ways in which you have reached out to us as a human family, the ways in which you have shown us through parables and through your teachings the errors of many of our ways. Help us not to make the mistakes that your friends and your supposedly enemies uh, back in your day uh, made. We want to be more like you. We want to accept you, the truths that you have presented. May that be true as a result of our experience today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hmm. One week before his crucifixion, Jesus traveled from Jericho up to Jerusalem, probably with thousands of people accompanying him. And they were so excited because they were sure they were about to see the big event. And what was the big event? Crowning him. They were going to crown him king, absolutely. And uh, more important than that, they were going to be freed from the Romans soon after yes, that. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, we're just, I'm just going to run through the list of things that happened because there's too much to talk about. You've heard whole sermons on just one of these things, I'm sure, many times. There was a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jesus went to the temple on, on Monday. He cursed the fig tree on his way to the temple on Monday. He, the question, there was questions about Jesus and, we might add, John the Baptist's authority. Uh, there was the parable of the two sons, the parable of the tenants in the vineyard, and the parable of the wedding feast, which is really two parables back to back. So, um, where do we go? Let's start with Matthew 20, verses 27 and 28. And if one of you wants to be first, this is Jesus talking to his disciples as he's prepared to enter Jerusalem. If one of you wants to be first, he must be your slave, like the Son of Man who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life to redeem many people. So, in those final days of the life of Jesus on this earth, he ministered to the needs of many, the poor, the sick, the needy. And at the same time, in fact, the Bible and Ellen White suggest that literally thousands of people had come, came to Jerusalem at this time because they knew that Jesus was going to be there and they figured this would be a great opportunity to get healed of whatever their problems were. At the same time, Jesus spoke parables with tremendous implications and we want to look at those. It's hard for us to even imagine the scenes in Jerusalem during those days. Have we grasped all that he tried to teach? Well, here's a, here's a suggestion. Our adult Sabbath school Bible study guide for Sabbath, May 28, 2016, suggests, but as incomprehensible as his servanthood is, the marvel goes even deeper. For he, the eternal God, is now facing the whole purpose of his coming here to give his life a ransom for many. Okay, the whole purpose of his coming here was to give his life a ransom, a ransom for many. <laughs> this self-denial, this self-abnegation will soon climax in a mystery that even angels desire to look into, 1 Peter 1, 12. And that is the cross. I thought we talked not too long ago about the reason <laughs> that Jesus came and it was not that. Well, here's an interesting quotation Fight Bell and White, and let, let's just look at a, one other Bible verse, and then we'll look at that quotation to see how it compares. 
Ephesians 3, 8 to 10. I am less than, this is Paul talking, I am less than the least of all God's people, yet God gave me this privilege of taking to the Gentiles the good news about the infinite riches of Christ and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages in order that at the present times, by present time, by means of the church, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. So that seems to suggest that what was happening there was even the angels were supposed to learn something about God. And then these words from Ellen White, the only way, now, Remember, the other quotation said the whole purpose. The only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the, and she says, the whole purpose of his own mission on earth, to set men right through the revelation of God. Now, our Bible study guide says, the whole purpose was to make a sacrifice to pay for our sins. Here it says, to set men right through the revelation of God. In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name, I have glorified thee on the earth, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Could it be possible that the most of his work had already been completed before he went through those final events? This paragraph from the uh, Bible study guide is purely made up. It's not in the, from the Gospels. No. There's no place any, uh, it's a misreading of the understanding of the rest of the Bible. Yeah. It's purely uh, a figment of somebody's imagination. Going on, she says, when the object of his mission was attained, now that would be why he came, right? The revelation of God to the world the Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. And that's from Jesus' prayer in John 17, 1 to 4. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, why don't we go there instead of uh, somebody else conjuring up something on their own? Yeah, uh, and it's also Romans 3, the first four verses of Romans 3. So here's the question for you, our first big question. How does his revelation of the character of God fit with the ransom and which was more important? By the way, you should probably say where you quoted Ellen White from. On that I will. That was from Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890, and in that article it's paragraph 6 and 9 I primarily quoted from. And that is never re-quoted in any Adventist publication. It no. did one time about 25 years ago. A, a, At a special I, request. Yeah, yeah but it, outside of that it is never quoted. So what about that? How does his revelation of the character of God fit with the ransom, or doesn't it? If it's a law of human nature that you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire, and Jesus came to show what the Father is like, John 14, 9, and then he could say, well, in John 15, 15, yeah. I, call you, I call you friends. Mm -hmm. uh, John 16, 25 and 26, I, I don't need to pray to the Father for you because the Father himself loves you. And then John 17, 1 to 4, I've accomplished the work you gave me to do. And he hasn't died yet. What do you think the, the meaning of the word ransom is on that part? Well, there are many variations on that. Uh, one of the very unusual or, or maybe scary interpretations of ransom was in the early years of the Christian church, the, the theory of the, the ransom theory was popular. The ransom theory basically said, by sinning, we have sold ourselves into the hands of the devil. So God comes down and he negotiates with the devil and he says, okay, I'll make you a deal. I will give you my son in exchange for all these sinners. And the devil says, well, I always wanted to have the place of the son. Uh, you know, if I, if I have control of him, I'll have that privilege. I don't care about these sinners anyway. So he agreed. The only problem was he couldn't hold on to Jesus and Jesus escaped from him. And so the God wins the great controversy by deceiving the devil. It sounds like he's a trickster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's Islam. They, yeah. they have the, the Allah is a great trickster. Uh, yeah. Well, 
let's look back at some of the prophecies leading up to this time. A very small group of Jews, probably no more than 1%, maybe 2% of the total Jewish population, accepted the challenge of Zerubbabel and Joshua and returned home to Jerusalem in the year 536-535 BC. About 15 years later, they were in the process of rebuilding their own homes, but basically nothing had been done to rebuild the temple. <coughs> now remember, at the time Jerusalem was finally destroyed, what was destroyed with it? Solomon's temple, right? Mm -hmm. It was completely just a pile of rubble. That's what was left. Um, Haggai and Zechariah appeared on the scene as two God-appointed prophets to stimulate that process, the rebuilding of the temple. And Haggai 2.9 says these very interesting words. The new temple will be more splendid, some translations have more glorious, than the old one. And there I will give my people prosperity and peace, the Lord Almighty has spoken. So now, how can this new temple that never... Now, by the time of Jesus, Herod, with the money from the Roman Empire, had expanded the, the temple complex. He actually had to do a lot of fill to, to make the platform that, on which he was built the temple bigger than it was in Solomon's day. So the, 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 it was bigger, but it wasn't more glorious. Not only that, we're going to read here in a moment, Ellen White's comment. But the second temple had not equaled the first in magnificent, nor was it hallowed by those visible tokens of the divine presence which, which pertained to the first temple. What were the visible tokens of the divine presence? Cloud. The cloud up above. What else? The In the most holy place? The Shekinah glory. Yeah, well, that's what she was talking about, the Shekinah glory. What the else? Ark the, the Ark of the Covenant was the, post where he, was the place where he was supposed to come down. Those were never... In, in, the, in the temple from the time at following the, the um, Babylonian captivity, never again. So there, there was no ark in Herod's temple in, in, in the days of Jesus. There was nothing but a bare rock there inside the most holy place. Uh, there was no manifestation of supernatural power to mark its dedication. If you look back in Exodus, God came down and filled, fulfilled the sanctuary out in the wilderness so that not even Moses could go in. Then when Solomon's temple was dedicated, he filled up Solomon's temple with his glory, and the priests couldn't go in. There's nothing like that happened with the temple after the Babylonian captivity. No fire from heaven descended to consume the sacrifice upon its altar. Does it sound like God's maybe not present? The Shekinah no longer abode between the cherubim and the most holy place. The ark, the mercy seat, and the tables of the testimony were not to be found therein. No voice sounded from heaven to make known to the inquiring priest the will of Jehovah. For centuries, the Jews had vainly endeavored to show wherein the promise of God, given by Haggai, had been fulfilled. Yet pride and unbelief blinded their minds to the true meaning of the prophet's words. The second temple was not honored with the cloud of Jehovah's glory, but with the living presence of one in whom dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily, who was God himself manifested in the flesh. I want you to think about that a little bit. What is God saying? Here's a temple built according to his specifications, perfect. I mean, it was the, the stones were cut just perfect in the quarry, transported to the temple, put together marvelously like a giant jigsaw puzzle covered with gold and so forth. And here's this marvelous temple, and yet God says, My son, as a human being, standing in the courtyard of an abandoned temple, basically, and speaking words of truth to the people who gathered around to hear him speak, was more glorious in God's eyes than all of that pomp and ceremony and gold and marble and whatever else you want, you want to add in there. More more glorious in God's eyes was Jesus, standing there quietly teaching the truth. I go on. The desire of all nations had indeed come to his temple when the man of Nazareth taught and healed in the sacred courts. In the presence of Christ, and in this only, did the second temple exceed the first in glory. But Israel had put, the, put, her, put from her the proffered gift of heaven. With the humble teacher who had, who had that day passed out from his golden gate, now this is talking about 
the time when Jesus said, okay, your temple is left unto you desolate. The glory had forever departed from the temple. Already were the Savior's words fulfilled, your house is left unto you desolate, Matthew 23, 38. Very sobering thoughts. What would he say? So Jesus teaching the people in a quiet voice is more glorious than the cloud, the pillar of fire, the, the thundering on Mount Sinai and all that sort of stuff. That's what God told Haggai. I think that has something to do with that still small voice that Elijah heard at Mount Sinai. Well, what about that magnificent triumphal entry? Let's just look at those verses. Matthew 21. As Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives. There, was, there Jesus sent two of the disciples on ahead with these instructions, you know, and go get the, 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 the donkey's colt. So forth. Then verse 4, this happened in order to make what the prophet had said come true. Tell the city of Zion, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble and rides on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now what's significant about saying those words? Prophecy. Yes. It's prophecy, but it also is a description of the, the normal way kings were brought to the temple and crowned right through Jewish history. So the disciples went and did what Jesus had told them to do. They brought the donkey and the colt, threw their coats over them, and Jesus got on. A large crowd of people spread their cloaks on the road while, road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds walking in front of Jesus and those walking behind began to shout, Praise to David's son. God bless him who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was thrown into an uproar. Who is he? The people asked. This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee, the crowds answered. So try to imagine, here's a, probably a couple million people gathered in Jerusalem. And so, they gather for the this Passover. is the Passover. And they, the, suddenly the word just sweeps through the city. There's a new king on his way. How do you suppose they would react? upset the powers that be. Christ was following the Jewish custom for a royal entry. The animal on which he rode was that ridden by the kings of Israel, and prophecy had foretold that thus the Messiah should come to his kingdom. No sooner was he seated upon the colt than a loud shout of triumph rent the air. I mean, you can just imagine how the people felt. I mean, you know, get rid of the Romans. The multitude hailed him as Messiah, their king. Jesus now accepted the homage which he had never before permitted. And the disciples received this as proof that their glad hopes were to be realized by seeing him established on the throne. Imagine how the disciples felt at that point. The multitudes were convinced that the hour of their emancipation was at hand. In imagination, they saw the Roman armies driven from Jerusalem and Israel once more an independent nation. All were happy and excited. The people vied with one another in paying him homage. They could not display outward pomp and splendor, but they gave him the worship of happy hearts. They were unable to present him with costly gifts, but they presented him with, but, but they spread their outer garments as a carpet in his path, and they also strewed the leafy branches of the olive and the palm of palm in the way. They could lead the triumphal procession with no royal standards, but they cut down the spreading palm boughs, nature's emblem of victory and waved them aloft with a loud acclamation and hosannas. Ellen G. White, Desire of Ages, page 570, paragraph 1. By the way, just to remind you, if you're interested in getting our handouts that have all these quotes put together for you, they're available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, not dot com dot O-R-G, theox dot O-R-G. So, again, Try to imagine in your mind what was going on in the hearts of the people of Jerusalem that day. While the crowds, many of whom had followed him from Gal all the way from Galilee, had come with Jesus and were so excited about his becoming king, the hatred of the Jewish leaders was at an all-time high. Both sides were motivated by a false idea of what the Messiah was to be and do. What do you think would have been different if they had realized why the Messiah was really here? Both sides? 
Have you ever asked yourself that question? How would they know that? No, I'm, I'm just saying that somehow they could have known. Suppose they could have. No, they didn't. They clearly didn't. Well, I, I was wondering if that, if what you're saying could be true, if, if things would work out like they did, like they were supposed to work out if they, if they did think like you were thinking right there. I mean, what, what, how many of them would just say, oh, this is, this is a waste of time, we'll go home? I think the tragedy of it is that the Pharisees, Sadducees, the high priests, if any of them had been studying the scriptures like they should have been for generations, they might have recognized him, but it was obvious yep. that they were so in love with themselves and the position they had, that was all out of mind. You know, you kind of need kind of need hindsight to figure that out, though. Yeah, well. I mean, because there's really no reason to change what they were believing until something happened and it didn't work out like they thought it would. I mean, that's, that's what's going to change there, your mind. There are a few verses in the Old Testament about the royal coming of the Messiah. Not many, a few. And they had blown those up because they were sure that that's the way the Messiah was actually going to come. Well, now we did in a way. We believe that the Messiah is going to come like that, in the clouds and glory, so forth like this. Could we be wrong? Absolutely not. <laughs> no, not a chance, right? In every detail, we have all, everything exactly right. Hmm? The timeline down perfect. Well, on Monday and Tuesday of that week, Jesus spent his hours in the temple. From the days of Adam to that point, animal sacrifices had been part of God's chosen method for teaching the world about the plan of salvation. Now, let's stop and think about that for a moment. When is the very first sacrifice mentioned in the Bible, animal sacrifice? Careful. In the Bible. I was going to say when he made clothing for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Well, but it does, yeah, that's, that's possible. We just don't, that's not mentioned. He strongly implied that right. Abel and Cain. Well, it, do, it does say that Cain offered. Cain, is, I mean, Abel offered the, the sacrifice of a lamb. Yeah. So that's the first it's time. Is it not really called a sacrifice? It was just an offering. Well, okay, an offering, yeah. Okay. But it, 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 it an offering of a lamb. The lamb was killed, so it was a sacrifice. Yeah. So now, all the way down to, to the days of Jesus, what had happened to that, and what were they supposed to learn from that process? From the killing of all, I mean, literally millions of animals down through the years were killed. What were they supposed to learn? The result of sin. Where result of sin, which is what? Sin leads to death. Yeah. Sin leads to death. That's what they were supposed to learn. Unfortunately, by the times of Jesus, the handling of the sacrifices, including the marketplace and the Gentile area of the temple courtyard, had made a farce out of the whole process. Is it obvious to us today how animal sacrifices teach about the plan of salvation? How many, how many people today would say, oh yeah, I, I understand clearly why God gave that system Name one person who does. <laughs> yeah. Well, animal sacrifices taught two things very clearly, or should have taught two things very clearly, if you look at the whole process, from the daily sacrifices, the daily offerings, to the once yearly thing at the, at the Day of Atonement. Animal sacrifices were supposed to teach them that sin leads to death. That would be the daily sacrifice. The sacrifices were part of a system that was to teach them that God wants to help them separate permanently from their sins. Now, how did that work out? What, what did the separating permanently from their sins, how did that work out in the sacrificial system? It was the Day of Atonement. Leviticus, huh? What it was supposed to, that was supposed to well, happen on the Day Leviticus of Atonement. Leviticus 16, yeah. Didn't Paul say that none of that stuff worked anyway? Wouldn't have worked anyway. Well, that, that's in Hebrews. That's over in the New Testament. Yeah, but isn't it true? No, oh, yeah, it's true. Well, but then, what then what's with the question? I don't know. Okay, well, the point is that they, on, the, on the Day of Atonement, 
what happened is supposedly the priest went in, the high priest went into the most holy place. He basically took upon himself the sins of the people for that whole year. He, without going into all the details of how that all happened. Symbolically. He, symbolically. He carries those sins out and he places them on the head of the scapegoat. What happens to the scapegoat? It's led out of the camp. It's led so far away from the camp, hopefully that it can never find its way back and probably is eaten by a wild animal or something. And what's that supposed to teach the people? God wants to separate us from our sins. God wants us to separate from our sins. Well, things had deteriorated so seriously in connection with the temple in Jerusalem that, quote, in the eyes of the people, the sacredness of the sacrificial service had been in a great measure destroyed. Desire of Ages, page 590, paragraph 1. And I guess we can figure that out right. Pretty easy. Look at Matthew 21, 12 to 17. Jesus went into the temple and drove out all those who are buying and selling there. Now, let's understand clearly what's going on here. Where is the buying and selling taking place? In the Gentile portion of the temple. What's the Gentile portion of the temple? Where the Gentiles were supposed to come and watch and observe and learn and become Jews. Okay, so there's a huge outside courtyard. Then there's an area for women, for Jewish women. And then there's an area for Jewish men. And finally, there's an area for priests. So those are the, the steps that you would went to if you, went out, you came in from outside, if you how far you could go, you were allowed to go. And there were signs up. And they actually have, the archaeologists have dug up some of those signs. You know, no Gentile beyond this place and so forth. It was there, clearly. But God intended for the Gentiles to come in that large area, observe what was going on in the temple, and learn about the true worship of God. So what did the Jews have done with that large temple area? Turned it into a cattle exchange industry. Why did they do that? Money to be made off the Gentiles. And the Jews. Well, no, not the Gentiles. Every, everywhere. I mean, it was wide well, open. the Gentiles weren't, weren't anything anyway, so you might as well do yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. That was their idea. You know, the Gentiles can't be saved anyway. Salvation is for only for Jews. So why not use this temple for some good money-making project? So Jesus went into the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the stools of those who sold pigeons and said to them, It is written in the scriptures that God said, My temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a hideout for thieves. The blind, and now notice what happens. He's driving everybody out. Not everybody, though. The blind and the crippled came to him in the temple, and he healed them. The chief priests and the teachers of the law became angry when they saw the wonderful things he was doing. And the children shouting in the temple, Praise to David's son. So they asked Jesus, Do you hear what they're saying? Indeed I do, answered Jesus. Haven't you ever read this scripture? You have trained children and babies to offer perfect praise. Jesus left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. There's a very interesting comparison. I won't take time to read it, but back in, in John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22, what had happened? Jesus had cleansed the temple once before, right? Three years before. Three years earlier when he first began his ministry. In our passage for this week, Jesus was actually cleansing the temple for the second time. Remember that God's original plan was for the outer courts, a large open area surrounding the temple, to be open for Gentiles to enter and observe and learn about the true worship of God. But unfortunately, the Jews had come to believe that salvation did not extend to anyone beyond Jews. During his earthly ministry, Jesus did everything he could to break down that false idea. So here's Ellen White's comment about that. At the first cleansing, that would be at the beginning of his ministry, the priests and the rulers fled in terror and awe. But after they had recovered from their fright, they said, Why did we go from the presence of that one man? They did not know who he was. They did not know that he was a representative of the Father, that, that, he, had, uh, made, that he had clothed his divinity with humanity. And yet they had a consciousness of his divine power. Bible Echo, October 1, 1894. Then coming to Desire of Ages 167, paragraph 2, Christ's exercise of authority in the cleansing of the temple had roused the determined hatred of the priests and rulers. I mean, why would they hate him? He was undermining them. He was not, he was, and he was 
wiping out their profits. I mean, this is the biggest, this is the biggest weekend of the whole year. And all their profits were scattered on the floor. <laughs> he was turning over the, the money tables. Well, Christ's exercise of authority in the cleansing of the temple had roused determined hatred of the priests and rulers. They feared the power of this stranger. Such boldness, this is the first cleansing, such boldness on the part of an obscure Galilean was not to be tolerated. They were bent on putting an end to his work. So at the second cleansing, remembering, thinking back to the first cleansing, three years before, the rulers of the temple had been ashamed of their flight before the command of Jesus. They had since wondered at their own fears and their unquestioning obedience to a single humble man. They had felt that it was impossible for their undignified... I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to chuckle when I read this. They, had, they felt it was impossible for their undignified surrender to be repeated. That yet they were now more terrified than before and in greater haste to obey his command. <laughs> there were none who dared question his authority. Priests and traitors fled from his presence, driving their cattle before them. Desire of Ages 591, paragraph 1 to 592. Don't you think that there was something flashing from the Spirit to make that happen? Because if that were true, how in the world could they run in down the street to be crucified? Well, and that's the question I really wanted to ask. What, why, did they, why did they run? What were they afraid of? I would, I would think that somehow the Spirit opened their mind for a moment to see some sort of divinity in him that as soon as it closed, well, then they wondered, what did we do that for? Yeah. You know, type of thing. And So um, you think the Spirit of God actually opened up their thinking, each of the these? Well, you know, some sort of sense that, uh -huh. that of who he was. And you probably any... maybe some, some, some thoughts came in their mind of what they were doing wrong for a little yeah. bit and they felt guilty and they just took off and of course all that closes back up again and they say well what do we do that for yeah i think when when you look at the overview of christ's general behavior he, firstly he had perfect control he could handle little children he could handle all the others but when push came to shove there was an authoritarian matter about him, and you can be sure his eyes were flashing. <laughs> well, they didn't dare challenge him. You know, Desire of Ages speaks in a number of places that, quote, divinity flashed through humanity. What do you think that was like? This is one of the places. It would have caught their attention like they'd never been <laughs> caught before. Yeah. They you think, you think it was a light? <clears throat> They might have been scared? I don't think it had to be something physical. I mean, there was, there was just something that invaded the mind that, um, mm -hmm. that they sensed okay. during that time. Well, I mean, it's possible God just could have given them this feeling of, of terror, and they ran. Mm -hmm. I think it was a challenge. Admittedly, he'd been there before, but both of them added up to one big dose of challenge that they had never had in that yeah. setup. It's one thing they to deal with a Roman general and, the, and his acolytes and all this, but this was different. This was coming from amongst them. Yeah. Do you think our churches are sacred and free of any worldly distractions? <laughs> Don't everybody Which smile. Are you referring to? <laughs> Do we ever let worldly gain enter our thoughts and actions on the Sabbath? Now, Jesus had been to the temple many times, yes. teaching yes. quietly to the people and had crowds around him. Mm -hmm. Didn't they recognize that this is the same person? They must have. I mean, they certainly didn't question his, you know, when they got a hold of him, they, they were sure they had the right person. Well, how do you suppose it happened that the desire for gain had led the very people, the priests and the Levites, the Pharisees and Sadducees, who were supposed to be the spiritual leaders of the Jews to turn the temple precincts into a large marketplace? Talk about, you know, think about going to your church 
and someone says, well, we don't need all this room in here. We're going to take off half of your church and we're going to turn it into a marketplace because we need some more money to maybe, you know, repaint the church. How would you feel about it? It's not needed to repaint the church. It's needed to line the pockets of the priests. No, you don't have ministers. to get so personal about this. <laughs> we could call it a farmer's market today. The farmer's market. <laughs> How can we make sure that we are not letting our desire to gain or maintain anything here, even something good, jeopardize what really matters, the eternal life in Jesus? Are we living lives that show that we are prepared to make Jesus number one? How would our lives be affected if we all did that? Do well, how would you know that you were doing that? I think... Well, I think the Bible seems to think doesn't seem to think that you would know that, but it does say that other people would see it in you. Would be noticed. Well, if other people saw it in you, well, then how are you supposed to know? Do you need to know? Yeah, you need to know. Why wouldn't you need to know? I think if you're doing your utmost to to be become like Jesus and represent Jesus, that's all you need to know. Well, some people think they are. Well, but I, I usually what happens is something starts happening and it, they, they know that they're doing something wrong by, in their reaction. Mm -hmm. And that should give them a clue that they're doing something wrong right there. But sometimes it doesn't. I mean, it just goes I, over their head. I would say that I'm nearly 100% sure that those who think they're doing everything right are probably not. In fact, I'm quite sure they're not. Well, well that means we got to think that we're doing everything wrong all the time, and then we'll be right? Well, at least we, <laughs> need, we need to be a lot more humble than we tend to be. Well, humble, that's a good word. because I think, that's I think those that would be doing it right would be doing it as quietly as they could, and somewhere somebody would probably ask them, why are you doing this? They, mm -hmm. They're going to find out one way or another. Yeah. Yeah. I had a very interesting experience this week at work. A bunch of the uh, medical assistants that I work with at the clinic said, um, how is this world going to come to an end? I thought, that's interesting. Where did that come from? So I said, well, you know, there are people who believe that, you know, three billion years from now or something like this, we're going to go up in a puff of smoke or um, some melt in, in, in some kind of whatever, but I said, that's not what I believe. If you believe what the Bible says, Jesus is going to come again. And they seemed to be quite surprised at that teaching. Tell us more. And so I tried to explain a little bit about what was coming. What was, so I thought that was interesting. I think maybe we're probably going to, I hope that we'll see more and more of that kind of people saying, well, what do you know that I need to know? You know? The cleansing of the temple was an act of compassion, suggested by our Bible study guide. Jesus was trying his best to show the Jewish people what was supposed to happen in the house of his father. But the cleansing was more than just a teaching exercise. It was an act of judgment. Those who had been using the temple courtyard as a marketplace knew that they were being condemned by this Galilean rabbi. And he recognized that God's curse was on their activities. I mean, you, you imagine you've got this whole cohort of guys all sort of holding each other's hands, making buku bucks, uh, you know, from all this illegal trading and so forth. And, buy, and they think they're, and they're in control of all the, they make the laws. They're in control of the government, okay? And they think we've got this thing sewed up just as tight as can be. And one man comes makes them all feel guilty and run. And the people say, hmm, that's very interesting. <laughs> What's going on here? Well, <clears throat> Jesus did some interesting stuff on his way to the city in the morning. Do you remember what he did? So we're jumping back in time before the cleansing of the temple? Yes, a little bit, that morning. Even though it comes later in Matthew? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. On, on his way back to the city early next morning, this is talking actually about Tuesday morning, Jesus was hungry. He saw a fig tree, by, I guess this is the Monday morning. He saw a fig tree by the side of the road and went to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. 
So he said to the tree, you will never again bear fruit at once the fig tree dried up. Okay, what's going on here? That particular kind of fig tree was, when it had leaves, it was supposed to have already had fruit. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to have fruit also at that time, and it didn't. Yes. And uh, this is a lived out parable. A parable of what? Of the nation of Israel that was supposed to produce fruit, but didn't. God's yeah. chosen people? God's chosen people. Oh, did I say the Israelites, or did I say the Adventist church? Oh, I hope you're not getting too personal. Now, did he put a curse on the tree to make it dry up, or did he just tell you what was happening here? There was nothing on the tree, and okay. it's never going to give fruit again. And then it dries up real quick. Well, what do you call that? Isn't that a curse? It's a supernatural well, maybe power. it's a maybe it's a illustration. Using his his power, we I mean, don't, if you don't see a tree changing in the course of one day, no matter what you do to it, except cutting it down or burning it, yeah. changing from green to all yeah. withered up. Well, that's that's all fine and good, but what I'm saying is that if you look at the whole thing as a as a teaching point, mm -hmm. I mean, he he kind of souped up things a little bit to to make it more plain. Yeah. But if you go up to a tree and there's nothing on it, he says, look at this tree. There's never going to be any fruit on it. There's leaves on it. And if there's no fruit on it now, there never will be. And so what do you do? Uh, you just walk away and the thing's green. Well, then it'd be better if it just dried up right then yeah. and, and carried out what he was well, saying. Depending Stop upon... Using the water. Yeah. Depending on which version, which gospel you read, it, they either, it either dried up right then or was dried up by the next morning as they came by. But this is a very strange thing to the disciples. They hadn't seen anything like Jesus do anything like that before. But they recognized that this was a lived out parable representing the Jewish leaders. Fortunately, not all, even if the Jewish leaders, ended up rejecting Jesus. We have mentioned these verses before, but somehow these don't get emphasized, I don't think, very much. Look at Acts 6, verse 7. And so the word of God continued to spread. Now this is, we're talking about into Acts now. The number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests accepted the faith. A great number of priests accepted the faith. Go to uh, Acts 15, verse 5. Let's see if I can get my cursor to do what I want it to do here. Come on. This is talking about the events uh, in about 50 years Around about AD. 50 A.D., yes. Um, Went to 50. Here we, hold on, we'll get there in a moment. But some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. So some of these believers, some of the, the Christian church were what? Pharisees. Pharisees. So there are priests and Pharisees in the Christian church. Does that excite you or scare you? And some of them hadn't changed their views on everything. Very much. Still tainted. Mm -hmm. Well, if you really kind of think about it, there probably was a, a, a good valid point that they were making because they were they were converting all these pagans, and it was like they weren't learning some of the background, you know, for, for being converted. And, well, you know, there's, there's, some, there's some idea that, you know, they got to learn more about the stuff that's, that we know about, and yeah. that might have been a way to, to, to get them well, to learn that unfortunately, way. Unfortunately, that attitude ended up in the arrest and imprisonment of, of Paul. Well, that's true, yeah. but but I'm just saying that that the thing could have gotten to be extreme after a while. Yeah. But uh, you know that, that you can't just convert a pagan and all of a sudden he's acting like a yeah. a Bible believing yeah. person. I mean, you still got a lot of stuff that he still remembers. Okay, I I, I want us all now to 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 try to put ourselves in the scene. 
hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people had followed Jesus from Galilee. They had, they had, re they remembered the ministry of Jesus from a year before and all that he had done, all the people he'd healed, many of them were probably people he'd healed. And they were there and they were, what were they expecting to happen at any moment? Expecting him to be crowned king. They expected him to be crowned king. And what does Jesus know at the exact same time? He's headed for the cross. He only has two or three days left to live. So try to imagine in your mind the kind of conflicts that were going on in Jesus' mind. Well, you know, you could almost see the, the work of Satan there, too. Mm -hmm. He knows that Jesus is not going to want to be king. And so he pushes them to really get him, get, get, get them to believe it's going to happen and for a great disappointment. Mm -hmm. And when people are disappointed like that, that's when he moves in for the kill. So what did Jesus during, do during those last precious hours? Well, here's one of the things he did, teaching. Listen to another parable. Jesus said, there was once a landowner who planted a vineyard. You're reading from where? I'm reading from Matthew 21, starting with verse 33. 21, verse 33. Listen to another parable. Jesus said, there was once a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a hole for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he let out the vineyard to tenants and went on a journey. When the time came to gather the grapes, he sent his slaves to the tenants to receive his share of the harvest. And it was pretty well recognized what percentage the, the owner was supposed to get. The tenants seized his slaves, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, the man sent other slaves more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Now, I think I wouldn't have been this foolish, but last of all, he sent his son to them. Surely they will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the owner's son. Come on, let's kill him. We will get his property. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants, Jesus asked. He will certainly kill those evil men, they answered. And who's doing the answering? The Jews. The scribes and Pharisees. And let the vineyard out to other tenants who will give him his, give him his share of the harvest at the right time. Jesus said to them, Haven't you ever read what the scripture says? The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned, about, turned out to be the most important of all. This was done by the Lord. What a wonderful sight it is. And so I tell you, added Jesus, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce the proper fruits. And who did he have in mind? Couldn't be the Gentiles, could it? Gentiles? How could it be Gentiles? The chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables and knew that he was talking about them. So they tried to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowds who considered Jesus to be a prophet. So what's going on here on a day-by-day -day basis, for a couple of days anyway? Jesus would go to the temple very early in the morning, and almost immediately there would be a huge crowd gathered around him. So the, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees are in a bind. Because here's all these crowds waiting to get their, their sick healed and to hear words of Jesus, and yet they want to arrest him and get rid of him. And they don't dare in front of these crowds. Well, I kind of think that that parable was a meaning bomb. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. That they don't really understand it until later. When here he is king, they think they're acting like king, and then he gets killed. Mm -hmm. And that fits that parable just perfectly. And after it's all said and done, well then, if they think about that parable, they can put that all together and they can get all kinds of things that, that's going on. Look at the prophecy that Jesus quotes. This is Psalm 118, 22 to 23. And when approximately was the Psalms written? A long time before this. <laughs> most, most in the days of David. The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. This was done by the Lord. What a wonderful sight it is. Now this particular prophecy might have been written in the days of Solomon. 
because what happened in the building of the temple, and I quote now, this is Desire of Ages. Uh, let me see if I can get the exact reference here very quickly. Uh, Desire of Ages 597, bottom of the page in 598. And quoting the prophecy of the rejected stone, Christ referred to an actual occurrence in the history of Israel. The incident was connected with the building of the first temple, which, which was the first temple? Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple. While it had a special application at the time of Christ's first advent and should have appealed with special force to the Jews, it has also a lesson for us. When the temple, so we need to know what the lesson is for us, right? When the temple of Solomon was erected, the immense stones for the walls and the foundation were entirely prepared at the quarry. This just blows my mind. I, I have had the privilege of visiting Jerusalem several times, and the last time I was there, they had opened up a passage down along the wall, this part of this wall which Solomon had built, and you go down quite a ways underground, and there's, there's, there's chunks of stone there that are estimated to be 160 tons and they fit so perfectly, you can't put a piece of paper between those stones. Yeah. How, did they, how did they do that? And how did they, not, they cut them in the quarry, and they have to move them, some of them probably long distances, and they bring them up there, and how do they move them and put them perfectly in place? And they, it was done quietly. And it was done relatively quietly. Oh, I think it's really quiet. <laughs> After they were brought to the place of the building, not an instrument was to be used upon them. The workmen had only to place them in position. Yeah, just pick them up and yeah. put them there, right? 160 tons. For use in the foundation, one stone of unusual size and peculiar shape had been brought. But the workmen couldn't find no place for it and would not accept it. It was an annoyance to them as it lay unused in their way. Long it remained a rejected stone. But when the builders came to the laying of the corner, they searched for a long time to find a stone of sufficient size and strength and of the proper shape to take that particular place and bear the great weight which would rest upon it. Should they make an unwise choice for this important place, the safety of the entire building would be endangered. They must find a stone capable of resisting the influence of the sun, of frost, of tempest. Several stones had at different times been chosen, but under the pressure of immense weights, they had crumbled to pieces. Others could not bear the test of the sudden atmospheric changes, but at last attention was called to the stone so long rejected. It had been exposed to the air, to the sun, to the storm, without revealing the slightest crack. The builders examined this stone. It had borne every test but one. If it could bear the test of severe pressure, they decided to accept it for the cornerstone. The trial was made, the stone was accepted, brought to its assigned position, and found to be an exact fit. In prophetic vision, Isaiah was shown that this stone was a symbol of Christ. Marvelous. No doubt the story was well known to the Jewish leaders. As one of his conclusions to this parable, Jesus made this statement recorded in Matthew 21, 44, and again in Luke 20, uh, look, look, Luke 20, verse 18. Everyone who falls on that stone will be cut to pieces, and if that stone falls on someone, it will crush him to dust. What is that supposed to mean? No idea? Well, I think he's talking about himself. Yes. And what the end result is going to be. If we're willing to fall on the stone and humbly become a part of his followers, then we will ourselves be cut to pieces, but we will in fact survive. If it falls on us, it will destroy us. And Ellen White says, And all who submit to his power, the Spirit of God will consume sin. But if men cling to sin, they become identified with it, then the glory of God, which destroys sin, must destroy them. At the second advent of Christ, the wicked shall be consumed with the spirit of his mouth and destroyed with the brightness of his coming. 2 Thessalonians 2.8 The light of the glory of God, which imparts life to the righteous, will do what to the wicked? Slay, Slay the wicked. Desire of ages 107 and 108. 
This is not an act, now another passage from Ellen White, this is not an act of arbitrary power on the part of God. The rejectors of his mercy reap that which they have sown. God is the fountain of life, and when one chooses the service of sin, he separates from God, that's Isaiah 59, verse 2, and thus cuts himself off from life. He is alienated from the life of God. Christ says, all they that hate me love death, Ephesians 4, 18 and Proverbs 8, 36. God gives them existence for a time that they may develop their character and reveal their principles. This accomplished, they receive the results of their own choice. By a life of rebellion, Satan and all who unite with him place themselves so out of harmony with God that his very presence is to them a consuming fire. The glory of him whose love will destroy them. So what is that glory going to do to the righteous? It's going to make them live forever. So it's not a difference in God's glory. It's the same glory, but it consumes the wicked. It gives life to the righteous. Well, we're running out of time, but we know about the story of the, the king and the, the people he, the, the, he prepared this banquet and the people who were invited didn't come. And so he sort of compelled people from the streets and so forth. He brought them in. And he knew these people were not be properly dressed for, for a banquet. So what did he do? Provided clothing. He provided the wedding garments for everyone. And then he came in at the end after the party was going and here was a man without a garment. And what did he say? Asked him where his cloak was. And yeah, why, what are you doing in here? And they ordered him to be bound and thrown outside. Well, our Bible study guide says something that I wish you'd think about. It says, we are talking about one person of the eternal Godhead bearing upon himself the full brunt of God's own wrath against sin. And these are the words that Ellen White says, upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. And I'm going to have to drop down here. But now with the terrible weight of, his, of guilt he bears, he cannot see, this is Christ on the cross, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance, the withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. What did Jesus die of? Separation. Separation from his Father. And what does the wedding garment represent? Well, it says in Revelation 19, 7 and 8, it represents the good deeds of God's people. Our kind and loving Father, as we read these words of encouragement and direction and compassion and judgment, help us to always choose the right side, that we may become more like you, that we may be among those who will one day look up and see you come in the clouds, is our prayer in Jesus' name.